everyone. This is Dr. Jenkins. So we just actually finished our lecture on chapter two. Um, and now that you've, you've seen me through Zoom, that's kind of nice, I guess. And I've seen some of you. So for this recorded video, what we're going to do is, is I, and I apologize for jumping around, but what I want to do is, is I want to finish what, where we left off in the Zoom lecture. So if you remember in the Zoom lecture, we talked about kinematics and kinetics. And I keep repeating myself because that just means it's that much more important. Kinematics was the description of motion. It can be linear or angular. And make sure that you can give some examples of what can be measured that would be linear kinetics or linear kinematics. And then we talked about um, some of the kinetics, some of the things that can be measured that would be kinetics. I think I just repeated myself there. Uh, we talked about torque a lot, mass, and we ended by talking about types of loads. Because with force, remember, and I'm going to keep writing this until it sticks in your head. Remember, when we, anytime we talk about kinetics, we're talking about some type of measurement that involves force. And when we have force, it can create a load. It can be a compressive load, which is a pushing load, a tension load, or a pulling load, and a shear load, where it's a side to side, or a combined that combines some combination of all of these. If we go back a little bit above that in the notes, some of the things that we can measure with kinetics. So if I go back to what we can measure some of the things involved with kinetics. I'm going to go all the way back. There we go. These are all things, measurements, that can be incorporated with a kinetic analysis. We talked about torque. We talked about force, right? Newtons is the unit for force. Newton meters is the unit for torque. Now, I want to go back and define center of gravity and base of support. Okay, so, and I have some slides here, so let me just, it's easier if I just go to the slide, I think. Okay, somewhere in here, there we go. So, the center of gravity, did I have a definition? No. Okay. <laughs> Center of gravity is the point at which, I'm going to write it down here. Point at which there is equal weight or mass, I'll say mass. There is equal mass above and below. and to the right and left. There's probably a more scientific definition, but I think this is the easiest in everyday terms. The center of gravity is the point at which there is equal mass distributed above and below and to the right and the left. So in simpler terms, it's the point where mass is equally distributed. I tend to like this top definition. And in this picture, it shows how the center of gravity might change. So if someone is just standing, this dot means that there's 50% of the weight above and 50% of the mass below, but also 50% of the mass to the back and to the front. If that person raises their arm up, well, now the center of gravity has gone up a little bit because now there is mass even higher, the center of gravity went up. Or if they bend over, and look, the center of gravity may not necessarily be on that person's body. This particular spot is where the entirety of the weight is distributed equally. Half of it is behind this dot, half of it is in front of it, half of it is above, 
half of it is below. And this involves force because that mass existing in space exerts a force. We're going to do more labs and lecture on this later. All right. And then related to the center of gravity is the base of support. The base of support is the area, usually it's the area below, um, area bound, or maybe I should say area, I don't necessarily like that word. Let's do area that covers or surrounds. all contact between body and support surface or because it may not necessarily be the floor it could be the parallel bar area that covers the contact between the body and support where's my brain today a good question support surface let me get that right maybe a better word actually and i apologize you know what to give you a little bit of inside baseball in front of me i have the textbook definition but the reason why i sometimes go back and forth is i'm trying to make a definition that makes more sense an area that encompasses i think that's a better word An area that encompasses all of the contact between the body and the support surface. So if you imagine this person standing, as it shows on the left, the center of gravity or center of mass is right there. But then if we look at where the body meets the support surface, the ground, we can see the base of support, the area that encompasses all of the contact points. So even though some of the mass may extend over here. So, you know, if he put his arm out, the mass may extend over here. So the mass above it may extend outside of the base of support. But what makes the base of support is the part of the body that's in contact. In this case, it's the feet that are touching the floor. So it's the area that encompasses all the points of contact between the body and the support surface. Okay, um, what I want to point out is, let me go over here, uh, I'll use black so you can see it better, I apologize. Um, there is the most stability, so later we're going to be talking about stability. There is the most stability when center of gravity falls within base of support. There is the most stability. Sometimes in athletics or motion, we want stability, right? Someone's trying to tackle you. You want stability so you don't fall over as easily. Sometimes we don't want as much stability. Think about it, a ice skater, right? They're actually very unstable as they glide through the ice. But then once they do a jump in the air, they actually want to be stable during that point. Well, no matter what it is, you are most stable when your center of gravity falls within the base of support. And that's, what hap that's what's happening with this drawing. The center of gravity is here, and it is in line with the base of support. If I go back, right, this person is not as, well, not as stable. But in this case, this is a better example. The person is most stable when the center of gravity falls in line with the base of support. On the right here, his center of gravity is mm, almost outside the base of support. So not only is it strongest when it's in the base of support, it's strongest when it's in the middle of the base of support. 
Okay. Okay, we, get, we went through those examples. Now, a couple more things to finish this chapter before we go back to the beginning and we'll review some of the terminology and human motion. So, I'm sorry to say, we have to talk about some vectors. And hopefully, you don't get too overwhelmed by that. Here's the simplest definition I can think of for a vector. It is a physical representation of magnitude and direction. So it's a specific thing. Not only does it look at the direction of something, it could be the direction of the wind, right? But it also looks at the magnitude. How forceful is that wind? Is it very forceful? Is it not as forceful? So the vector itself is just it's kind of an abstract thing. It's some kind of representation. I mean, it's abstract in theory, but it can also become a very real physical thing. And my example is the wind. It's the easiest example I can think of for this class. But we'll get there. So my suggestion is just to start with the basic definition. A vector is a physical representation of magnitude and direction. So here we can have multiple vectors that can combine on each other. So you might have a vector here. And in this case, sometimes when we draw, the length of the arrow is trying to show the magnitude, where a shorter length arrow is a smaller magnitude and a longer length arrow is a larger magnitude. So you can add them together. We have this magnitude and direction of force, and then we have this magnitude and direction of force. When they're combined, it results in that. So th this is what it would look like if you draw them. We don't have to draw them. We're not going to draw them. Be able to give the definition, physical representation of magnitude and direction. And here are some examples. And we can utilize this in both kinetic and kinematic studies. I know I gave the example of force. So it might, it might relate to force, but it may not relate to force. It may just relate to projection. So the picture of the baseball player here, that would be a kinematic. But either way, I want to give you some practical examples of how vectors might come into play. So I really like the example of someone in a boat in the water. And it could just be a fisherman or a fisherwoman, but it also could be someone who's trying to row. Maybe it's a kayaker or whatever. We have different vectors. And in this case, this is kinetic because it is involving force. Again, I can't spell today. I don't know what's going on with me. So we have a vector in a certain direction and a certain magnitude of the current. And then in a different direction and a slightly lower magnitude, see the wind arrow is not as long, we have a different vector of the wind. Both of those would come together to move the boater that way because the resulting vector even though we have one arrow from one magnitude and direction from that one magnitude and direction from that it has a physical effect that it would push the person that way this may come into play when if you were a kayaker trying to figure out how to row against it I mean, if you're fishing, you probably don't care. You just fish and let the current wind take you. But if you're trying to figure out how to paddle to go the direction you want, it is helpful to consider the current and the wind. You have to. We can also utilize this in something like pool, where you might strike the ball in attempts to hit this ball at a certain place and in attempts to move it a certain way. So in essence you would be needing to consider certain vectors adding together. Or we can look at the projection of a baseball. 
because there is a velocity, there's a speed with which the ball is being hit, and there's a direction. And the speed and direction will result in where it goes. You know, if you hit it in this direction, if I keep the arrow the same, but it's a slow speed, it might be an out in the outfield. But in the same direction, at a faster speed, it might be a home run. You don't, we're not going to be calculating any vectors. Just be able to give a definition and be able to give one example in real life or sports. And I don't mean describe in detail in an essay and give me a numerical example. Just be able to give me a simple example, how the current and wind affects a boater, how you would need to consider how you strike the ball and how hard you strike it in pool, a baseball, looking at a hit baseball and where it lands based off of the direction it's hit and the magnitude or speed. You know, Another example of this, and I just added this to the PowerPoint, this updated PowerPoint is on Moodle, so this might be a new slide, and if it is, go to Moodle and get the most recent one. I'm a cyclist, former triathlete, um, four-time Ironman, not that I want to brag or anything, but um, this is something, you know, cyclists like to draft, right? So they get behind the person in front of them and that shields them from the wind and therefore they can produce a little bit less power in order to keep their momentum the same. And something that I never understood for, I'm embarrassed to say for quite a long time, and I'm not going to ask you this on a test, it's just another example. And this involves a vector, right? Magnitude, it's a physical representation of the magnitude and direction of a force, in this case, wind. Sometimes when I've been cycling or I've watched it on TV, there's something called an echelon. And it finally, I finally understood it when I thought about vectors. And I finally understood it when I thought about birds. You know, have you ever thought, have you ever wondered, why do birds fly in that V pattern? It would be like cyclists flying in a V. Well, it's the same idea behind drafting, but it happens when the wind is coming from the side. If the wind is coming head on, if the wind is if the wind is coming head on, the person behind them will draft right behind them because they want to be shielded from the wind. If they want to be protected from the wind, they go right behind this person. And because the wind is coming straight on, they're protected from the wind when they're right behind them. But if the wind is coming from the side, it would no longer make sense for the bikers to go right behind them because they'd still be in the wind. So that's why bikers form an echelon or they draft kind of in line with the wind. So if you're trying to shield yourself from the wind, you would want to be behind that person in the direction of the wind. This is a vector. We have a direction of wind with a certain force. And that's the same reason why these birds go behind, right? So in this example, let's just say that the wind is coming from this direction. Well, these birds are going to basically draft right behind the bird in this way to protect themselves from the wind. I know. All right. Um, as an aside, you don't need to know this. In physiology, we can also measure vectors. We can, we can measure vectors of electricity. So in the heart, when we have different portions of the myocardium contracting, you get a contraction of the myocardium in that direction. And remember, the length of the arrows tells us the strength or magnitude. And then when a different part of the myocardium contracts, you get this one. Well, the mean, when you put these two together, the mean result is longer. All right. I got a little carried away there, but what can I say? All right. You can see on your notes there, and I don't need to really write anything about it because it's on your notes. Roman numeral six, factors affecting motion. 
Well, if we're talking about motion, whether we analyze it through kinematics or kinetics, whether the motion is linear or angular, whether we do our data analysis through a qualitative or quantitative mean, no matter what we do, there are things that affect motion. And I'm not going to go into detail with these yet because we're going to be talking about them later in the semester. We basically have whole chapters on these. We're going to have a whole chapter on articulations and lever systems. We're going to have a whole chapter on bone, how that relates to motion, a whole chapter on muscles, how that relates to motion, and a whole chapter on the neuromuscular part of it, how we get the nerves to move the muscle. So all those things affect motion too. So it's not just the load or the force or the wind. It's also things within the body. But we're going to talk about those later. So I will save that for later chapters. You don't need to know it now. Now our last Roman numeral, Roman numeral number seven here, motion and injury. I do want to bring up something called the load deformation or deformation curve. Maybe you've heard of this before. When we talk about the load deformation curve, it, we're referring to the load deformation of a human tissue. So let's say we look at bone. Let's say, for example, we apply a load on a human bone. Well, human bones are meant to handle loads. Take your femur, big, huge femur bone. It can withstand a lot of compressive force, can it? Yes, right? It's meant to withstand a lot of compressive force. What are the things that cause that force? Our body weight. If we jump and land, now we're adding even more of a load because we've jumped and now we have more than just our weight. We have kind of an accelerated weight coming down. What this is telling us is there's going to be a certain point in time where we can apply a load to a tissue. And in this case, the bone may bend a little bit, but it can handle it. So what this is telling us is, well, actually, let me, let me go back. So if you look at your notes, it says number one definition. The definition of the low deformation curve is, because it's a graph, we're really looking at a relationship. This is looking at the relationship between load placed on a tissue. I mean, you can use this to describe metals or concrete, or we can use it to describe things outside of the body, but we're going to be focusing on the human body. This is a curve that gives us information about the relationship between load placed on a tissue and that tissue's deformation. By deformation, what we're talking about is damage. Will that tissue become deformed? And that tissues it keeps happening tonight. And that tissues deformation. So it's a relationship between the load that can be placed on a tissue and that tissue's deformation. Relationship between load and deformity. There is something called the elastic region. The elastic region is when there is load placed on something, and I'm going to, I'm using bone as an example. The elastic region is when there is load placed on the bone, but no permanent definition. So the elastic region is when there's a load placed on the tissue, 
but there is no permanent deformation. If you jump in the air and land, upon landing, there is going to be some load placed on the femur, and the femur will probably bend a little bit. You don't see it with your naked eye, but, you know, because of the spongy bone and the epiphyses of bone, haha, anatomy review, bones have a little bit of give to them, and that makes them stronger overall. But the point is, there is type, there is amounts of load where the tissue may deform a little, it may bend a little, but there's no permanent deformation. It is elastic. When the load is removed, then the tissue returns back to normal. I mean, this is telling you things you already know. It's nothing new. We're just applying terms to it, and then we're showing you a graph. Right? All we're saying here is, if we put a little bit of load, if you put a smaller amount of load, maybe this amount of load, or this amount of load, or even this amount of load. If I put smaller amounts of loads on tissues, they may bend a little bit, but then they go back to their original structure. There's no permanent damage. So there's an elastic region where the load is minor, and the tissue may bend a little bit or deform a little bit, but there's no permanent damage, and the tissue goes back to its regular structure. But then we have the yield point, the point at which it goes from the elastic to the plastic region. The plastic region is when we do have permanent deformation. So in this region, there has been a higher amount of load. And once we get to that higher amount of load, it's so much load that the tissue will deform a little bit, and it won't go back to its regular structure. Some permanent deformity occurs. And then, of course, if we give even more load, there's an ultimate failure point where that tissue will completely break or tear. Now, in the case of bone, there's not that much difference between the yield point and the ultimate failure point. We'll talk about that when we get to the bone chapter. Right now, because we're gonna we're gonna actually provide you with a load deformation curve for different types of tissue muscle, bone, etc. But right now, all I want to do is I want to introduce this. I just want to introduce what this curve is. Relationship between load and deformity of a tissue. When the load is minor, usually the tissue, it might deform a little, but it's in the elastic region. After the load has been released or taken away, the tissue will go back to its original structure. But then there's a yield point at some point where there's been more load placed and it's so much load that there will actually be some permanent deformation. And now we're in the plastic region. And eventually, if we give even more load, there'll be ultimate failure. All right, good stuff. Um, I'm not going to ask you this, but this can be related to injury. What are going to be the highest possible types of possible? Ah, what are going to be the highest possible areas of injury in this curve? When we have the highest loads, when we have the highest loads, and we load most often. Oh, that's the wrong way. And we load most often. Don't worry about that. Okay, let me um, add one of these since we're here. I'm going to go back to that PowerPoint. At the end here, 
Um, it talks about acute versus chronic loads, and then micro versus macro. Um, hopefully, you already know what these are. I just want to make sure so that there's no excuse here. We're talking about loads, right? An acute load versus a chronic load. An acute load is a load all at once. Versus a chronic load is a load that occurs over time. You hit your elbow on something and you get a bruise. That's an acute load. Happened all at once. Or shortly. In a small period of time. A chronic load. Over time, there's friction between your toe and the front of your shoe and you develop a callus. That's a chronic load. An acute load. You slide into first... You don't slide into first base, right? You slide into second base and you fracture your tibia. It's an acute load. The load, the fracture, occur occurred because of an acute load. Chronic load. Over the course of the baseball season, you develop tendonitis. Because over time, smaller loads even though that one smaller load didn't lead to anything over time. It was a load delivered over time. Both of these can lead to deformation of tissue. If I go back to that load deformation curve, that load can occur all at once or it can occur over time. Both can lead to, lead to deformation or damage. And then we have macro versus micro trauma oh trauma macro versus micro the top here has everything to do with timing did the load happen all at once or over time the bottom one has everything to do with magnitude or intensity. Was it a macro trauma, big load or trauma? Or was it a micro trauma, smaller load or trauma? ACL tear probably is going to be caused by a macro trauma has to be a lot of force, macro, a lot of force at once, usually. It's usually acute and macro. Micro is usually a smaller load, is a smaller load. A stress fracture. A stress fracture is the result of micro trauma. Smaller loads, usually over time. Both of these can lead to deformation, but... The macro trauma is more likely to lead to deformation. Wouldn't a bigger load be more likely to lead to deformation? So be able to define those. All right, folks. I don't think there's any other way for me to... I don't want to do that. To get back to the beginning, I've got to go through all these slides. So turn your head so you don't get motion sickness. Maybe it keeps you awake here. So what I want to do now is I want to go back through the beginning of this chapter. And the reason why I'm doing this more through this video is because it's a review. Everyone has had to have had anatomy and physiology, right? We'll see how much you remember. Okay. Now, <laughs> this is a review, right? You've heard it before. But it's still important, right? We have to have a common terminology when we're describing motion. It's really easiest, best done when we have a common language, common terminology. And that's what it's about. We know that. When we talk about terminology of the body, up, down, right, left, front, back, we reference everything from the anatomical position. Palms facing forward is the big thing, right? So the front of the palms... The, excuse me, the front of the forearm or front of the hand is palm side. Make sure you review 
all the directional terms. Look, I didn't even put the slides on here because you should already know this. Anterior, posterior. We know anterior means front, posterior means back. Medial, lateral. Medial, closer to the midline. Lateral, away from the midline. Superior, closer to the head. Inferior, closer to the foot. Proximal and distal usually refer to the limbs, whether it's the arm or the leg. Proximal means closer to the point of attachment of that limb. Proximal means closer to the point of attachment of that limb. Distal means further away from the attachment of that limb. Prone is lying on your stomach. Supine, lying on your back. Superficial is towards the surface. Deep is deep. As I was saying when we first met over Zoom, if you have questions with this, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, but this is a review, and it is my expectation that you will review these and know them. We also have specific terms for movement, right? And I'm going to write these down to make sure we're all on the same page. Flexion is a motion where we narrow a joint angle. It's kind of hard to see with the shoulder, but if we think about doing a bicep curl, flexion, to curl or flex, to bend, it's usually to bend. We narrow a joint angle. Extension means to lengthen a joint angle. Extend usually means to straighten. So think of a bicep curl as flexion, or narrowing the joint angle at the elbow. And then when we straighten the elbow back out, it is extension. We're going to have a chance in lab to review all of these. With the shoulder and the hip, flexion and extension are a little bit harder. For the shoulder and the hip, flexion and extension are basically forward flexion. So this dude has brought his hand, his arm up forward in front of him, as opposed to coming to the side. So at the shoulder and the hip, flexion means bringing the shoulder or hip forward versus extension would be to bring that arm backward. Okay, abduction and adduction. These are a little bit easier, I think. This is everything in relationship to the midline. Abduction is to move away from the midline. Adduction is to move back towards the midline. Our fingers can abduct and adduct. Our hip can abduct and adduct. Our shoulder can abduct and adduct. Our elbows cannot, so some joints can only flex and extend. Internal and external rotation. Internal is the same thing as medial rotation, to rotate in towards the midline. External or lateral rotation is to rotate away from the midline. Internal or medial rotation to rotate towards the midline. Keyword here is rotation. External or lateral rotation is to rotate away from the midline. Circumduction would be a combination of flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, internal, external rotation. Circumduction, I think of the third base coach, circumducting, making a big wide circle with a shoulder to round someone home. Then we have some joint specific terms. When we look at, let's look at the ankle. That's on your notes first. Dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, inversion, eversion. These are only, these terms are only applicable to the ankle. You can dorsiflex, bring your toe up towards you. It's like stretching your calf. You can dorsiflex, bring your toe up towards the sky. You can plantar flex, point your toe down, like you're stepping on the gas pedal of a car. You can invert, move your, rotate your ankle in. 
Inversion, rotate your ankle in. Eversion, rotate your ankle out. These are only applicable at the ankle. Pronation and supination are only applicable at the forearm. To supinate the forearm means to move the forearm, twist the forearm so your hand is palms up. To supinate the forearm is to twist the forearm so the palm is facing up. To pronate means to twist the forearm so the palm is facing down. At the wrist, we can do ulnar and radial deviation. This is going to be helped by remembering that the ulna is always on the pinky side and the radius is always on the thumb side. Right? This is the ulnar side. This is the radius side. If I could spell, where's my mind today? I think it's because I'm hungry. <laughs> To radial deviate means to move the wrist towards the thumb. Like you're moving the wrist where the thumb is initiating the movement, kind of. You're moving towards the direction of the thumb. Because the thumb is on the radius side. Ulnar deviation is to move the wrist kind of out towards the ulna. Again, this is straightforward, so I'm kind of going quickly here. Lateral flexion, sometimes with the trunk and the neck. With the trunk and the neck, we can do lateral flexion, which is to bend, but towards the side. Forward, for if it was just regular flexion, the trunk would be moving forward, like doing a sit-up. Trunk extension would be like moving backwards, the opposite of a sit-up, forward or backwards. But lateral tells us we're bending to the side. Protraction and retraction. Good, make sure I don't skip one. Where's my protraction and retraction? All right, we're going to have to go here. So the scapula... And actually the mandible too, but the scapula can do elevation, depression, but also protraction and retraction. It doesn't list it here, but we can talk about it. Only happening at the scapula and the mandible, but we'll talk about the scapula. To elevate the scapula is to do like a shoulder shrug. And some people think that that motion is happening at the shoulder, <clears throat> but it's really happening at the scapula. We can elevate the scapula, do a shoulder shrug. Moving back down would be a depression of the scapula. I can elevate the scapula, then I can depress it, push it back down. But then I can protract. Scapular protraction is to point your scapula forward. Instead of raising your shoulder towards the sky, you move your shoulder forward, protraction. Imagine like pushing someone on a swing. When you push or punching someone, not that you would do that, but when you push forward, your scapula is protracting. When you bring your shoulder blades back together, that's scapular retraction. So I can protract my scapula forward or retract my scapula backward. Okay, circumduction can happen at the shoulder, hip, and the finger. Last one on there, which I don't have a picture of, but that's okay, is opposition and reposition. Opposition is to bring two digits apart. I'm sorry, together. Let me write this down because I don't want to confuse you. I'm sorry. Opposition is to bring two or more, but we'll just say two, 
two digits together. Those of you going into occupational therapy and physical therapy, um, you'll be working on some of this opposition and reposition. So let's say you want to ask someone to bring their pinky and thumb together. Reposition is to put them back. I know this might not seem like very much, especially maybe for athletes, but you can really think about this in the rehabilitation world. So our fingers and our toes to a lesser extent, we really rely on our ability to move our digits. So sometimes if that mobility is lost, we have to practice it. So we do some opposition and reposition exercises. All right, the fun continues. My friends, make sure you review the planes of the body. I don't need to say this, do I? Man, we have the <clears throat> sagittal plane. Sagittal plane divides the body into right and left halves. In red is the sagittal plane. Divides the body. It's an imaginary plane. Imaginary plane that divides us into right and left sides. Sagittal. What types of motions happen in the sagittal plane? Flexion and extension. This is a little bit more challenging, but think of it as if this guy was to do shoulder flexion forward, right? Hip flexion forward or hip extension backward. Imagine what motion is parallel to that plane. If you do flexion and extension of the shoulder or hip, that motion is parallel to the sagittal plane. And as you can see on your notes, as you can see on your notes, the sagittal plane motions occur around the medial-lateral axis. Okay? And then be able to give some examples that occur in this plane. Running... Cycling, a softball pitcher, anything that involves a lot of flexion and extension. Cross-country skiing, that's a good one. Cross-country skiing, a lot of flexion and extension. Those are all sagittal plane. Okay, this is just memorization. It should be a review. Let's switch colors. To, uh, I don't want to use blue because we just did. Let's use purple. Now I'm going to talk about the frontal plane. The frontal plane divides us, as the name suggests, into front and back halves. Oh, man. I was getting confused with the sagittal plane. This is why I, and I didn't major in art. This one. Frontal plane divides us into front and back halves, as the name suggests. The frontal plane occurs, so it divides us into front and back halves. Right? It occurs, motion in the frontal plane occurs along the antero-posterior axis you do need to know everything that i'm writing down here you do need to know i mean really anytime i write something down you need to know it but this is going to come back to you in lab this is going to come back to you in your final lab project and whenever i teach this course come the final lab project some people leave this blank what was the plane of motion and what was the axis i'm writing it down right sagittal plane Flexion extension, medial lateral axis. Frontal plane divides us into front and back halves. Motion occurs along the anteroposterior axis. And what kind of motion occurs in this plane? Abduction and adduction. Remember, I was saying, like, what motion occurs parallel? If I abduct my hips and shoulders out, it's kind of parallel to the frontal plane. 
What are examples of motion? Cartwheel. A cartwheel motion occurs in the frontal plane. Jumping jacks is probably the best one. Be able to give examples of motions that occur primarily in each plane. Because really, folks, most of our motions are biplanar or multiplanar, I should say. Most of our motions, think of a baseball pitcher swinging a bat. Um, most of our motions, you know, getting up out of a chair. Every, most everything is multiplanar. But sometimes we're going to break a motion down, and in that one snapshot, if you took a picture of a person in that moment, what plane of motion, right? A jumping jacks, because it involves mostly abduction and adduction of the shoulder and hips, that is an activity that occurs primarily in the frontal plane. Which leaves, of course, the transverse plane. Let's go with green for transverse. The transverse plane divides us into top and bottom halves. Transverse plane. Motion in this plane occurs along the longitudinal axis. Maybe you want to make up a little like mnemonic device to remember some of these. What motions are occurring here? Rotation or twisting. Internal, external rotation, pronation, supination. And then what are some examples? I mean, there's so many, right? But what are some things that involve a lot of rotation? Think of a figure skater spinning. I mean, that's a really good example, right? But most of our motions, think of a, a quarterback throw. You know, when a quarterback throws a ball, there's some rotation at the pelvis and the shoulder and the hips. Okay, but you can see in your notes, most of our motions are multi-directional or multi-planar. Even though we might take a snapshot, and describe each motion per plane in that snapshot. In reality, we will put things together. Things are multiplanar. Okay. As I was thinking about the notes here, I did realize that I forgot to review one um, joint-specific term. So I apologize. But if you go back under joint-specific terms, you can see horizontal adduction and abduction. With this one, we're talking about the shoulder. So it is abduction and adduction in that we're moving away from the body, abduction, or towards the body, adduction. But it's occurring in the horizontal plane. Um, so imagine if you flex your shoulder so you're putting your arm up right in front of you. Then you can abduct or adduct so with your shoulder in that horizontal plane i can abduct I can move out or i can adduct move in one of the best examples of horizontal adduction is a peck fly exercise or a seal you know how a seal moves like ur, ur. <laughs> by bringing your shoulder bringing your arms in towards yourself horizontal adduction but it has to be with your arm flexed out in front of you not with your arm at your side that's why it's called horizontal all right good stuff we are moving along i mentioned some of these in our in-person lecture on zoom and now we're just getting the the details right so we mentioned linear and angular I began to say this in the, the Zoom call. You know, a lot of these terms may seem overwhelming. So it's important that you spend time studying so you can kind of memorize the difference. 
but the benefit too is once you start to memorize the definitions then it doesn't become quite so intimidating we've already talked about kinematics and kinetics kinematics description of motion acceleration velocity speed kinematics then we had kinetics study of force displacement was an example of that right force or just measuring force in newtons or torque that was an example of kinetics well now we have the other definitions linear and angular this one i do want you to be a little more specific linear is a type of motion or movement this just means movement linear is a type of movement that occurs one direction and one speed to be truly linear all parts of the body would move together as a unit but what i really want to uh, what i really want to focus on is linear movement that occurs in one direction at one speed sometimes you might see it called translation but i'm not going to ask you that we're going to stick to the definition of linear movement that occurs in one direction at one speed when it moves in that one direction at one speed it may move in a straight line at one direction and one speed that would be rectilinear but it could also be curvilinear it could still move in one direction overall i start here and i end up here but instead of being a straight line it takes a curved line And there is a category that would still be considered linear that's called circular where the motion occurs not surprisingly in a circle the example that i can best give to this is a softball pitch kind of that windmill pitcher so be able to give some examples of each of these first define linear movement in one direction at one speed technically even though sometimes we're a little bit looser with a definition technically all parts of the body move together as one unit but really we're going to focus on linear movement in one direction at one speed it could be in a straight line rectilinear or it could be in a curved line curvilinear or we could have everything working in one motion at one speed in a circle like a softball pitch what are some examples nope okay got ahead of myself we gave some examples in lecture on the zoom call if i go back um you know i i do i think it's pretty good here so we have rectilinear and curvilinear rectilinear is when something goes in a straight line right so here this person's going up or it could be a ball if it was possible just maybe like a bullet that'd be a, a bullet a bullet might be rectilinear rectilinear is in purple curvilinear we're still going in one direction at a one speed but it's curved could be a person dismounting from something that's rectilinear oh, excuse me curvilinear and then there could be a circular motion like the windmill pitch okay Be able to give some examples of these um i think sometimes people overcomplicate it um because we can get into the nitty-gritty but we're not so try and keep it simple um, a linear motion is where the body or body parts or the object is moving at one direction at one speed theoretically technically all parts of the body move together as a unit be able to talk about rectilinear, curvilinear, and circular. And then we introduce angular. Angular motion is when that motion occurs around an axis. And because of that, 
segments are moving at different speeds. So you're not going in one direction and things are occurring at different speeds. Most movements in the body are angular. Most movements, most everything we do is angular. I mean, we could, we could be really basic and we could say, well, if I'm running, we could be really basic and say, if I'm running, it's a rectilinear motion. I'm moving in one direction at one speed. If I'm running in a straight line, 100 meter sprint. That's the definition we're going to use, right? So I like that. Because by and large, if you're running a 100 meter sprint, not if you're running through the trails in the woods, not if you're running around the track that's an oval, if you're running a 100 meter sprint straight line, we're going to call that rectilinear. Because by and large, you're moving at one direction at one speed. Now, a different analyst might get more picky and say, well, you know what? When you're running, not all parts of the body are moving together exactly. Your legs are moving at one speed, but maybe your arms are pumping at a slightly different speed. Do you see what I'm saying? So you can get really picky, but we're going to keep it a little bit more general. If I were to give you an example of a runner doing a 100-meter sprint in a straight line, we're going to consider that rectilinear, right? If I give you the example of someone dismounting off of a beam, that's curvilinear. If I give the example of a softball pitch or something like that, that's going to be a circular linear motion. Pretty much everything else is angular, right? If I talk about a baseball pitch, there's trunk rotation, right? And even in a softball pitch, if you want to get into the nitty-gritty, well, of course, their shoulder isn't just moving in flexion and extension. They've got to abduct a little bit. So you can get in the nitty-gritty, but we're not. Try and keep it as simple. Also, we can talk about motion as static and dynamic. It's just another way of looking at it. So these terms don't necessarily always have to be able to be described together. Sometimes it's just other ways of looking at it. Dynamic is when something is in motion. Static is a... What's the best way for me to say that? I mean, I think you know what I'm talking about, right? Static is just like a freeze frame. Or not in motion. So you really could just have someone standing there still. Well, that's static. Or I could have someone doing a motion and then pause. And in that pause, it's static. Or I have someone doing a motion and I take a picture of them. That picture I'm looking at is static versus if I have them actually moving in motion, it's dynamic. All right, folks, great job. Um, I really want you to do well. So some of this might be a review, but don't be embarrassed or shy if you have to do some reviewing from A and P. Um, you really want to get, get this down well because we're going to continue to use it. We're going to use it in lab. You're going to need it for your final lab project. We're going to be bringing these terms back in other chapters. Okay, I'm here if you have questions. See you next time.